actually did record the video to Kim. <laughs> but I did. So, we're going to sing happy birthday one more time. <laughs> Judge one another? And we're going to look into that today. 
But doesn't she say not to judge? You can't judge me. Who are you to tell me where I'm at with God? This is usually how this is expressed. The fact that only God can judge us ought to put fear in our hearts. Yeah. Revelation chapter 20. On, it is true that God will judge all of us. Yeah. And let's see what he bases that judgment off of. Yep. Revelation 20 and verse 12. The scripture says, And I saw the dead and great and small standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Woo! Yeah. This is one appointment that you will not be late for. That's right. This is one appointment that you will not miss. In fact, Hebrews 9.27 says that it's appointed that all men will die. That's the one thing we all have in common in here. We're all going to die. And we're all going to face that great white throne and stand before God. And he will judge us based on how we live our lives. The scripture teaches that God has a book, it says, that records all the different deeds that we've done in our lives. And he'll use those deeds and he'll use his word to make a judgment based on whether we'll spend an eternity in heaven with him or an eternity separated from him in the lake of fire. This judgment ought to put a fear and a reverence in our hearts of God that we are being evaluated for how we live. God has standards. He has expectations. And in an age that's preached a cheap grace, it's time to get back to what the Bible teaches. Are you with me right here, church? God will judge us. And that ought to put a fear in us. Usually the person saying this as a defense has no fear of God. No understanding of what that judgment means. You know, I've been to New York City before. You know, you ever seen Times Square? And I often thought about what if what if you were standing there in Times Square with the entire church on a little field trip or something, and all of a sudden on that big screen, everything you ever done started playing? Wow. What about this past week? You go, well, amen. I became a Christian. Amen. What about this past week? Everything just started playing up there on the screen. I mean, would you turn that off, throwing rocks at it and stuff? <laughs> but, you know. Or, or could you, before God said, clear, go, you know something? I did my best to live right before the Lord. Are you oh, right here, guys? Come on, There'll be a judgment. But the question comes, can we judge each other? Are we supposed to judge each other? You know, it's interesting, in Matthew chapter 7, if you'll turn there, Come on, we're going to look at a couple, three forms of unacceptable judgments, that we, things that we're not supposed to judge each other on. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says in verse 1, give you a moment to turn there. Come on, Mike. Go, Mike. Matthew 7, verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Well, that's interesting. That means the standard that we set in which we look at other people is going to be the same standard that's used to judge us. Wow. Now, we'll talk about what that measure is supposed to be in a moment. Huh. But here's the thing that clouds up the measure, if you will. If you look in verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? Yep. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Amen. So God, Jesus does say you are supposed to make a judgment, but you can't when there's a plank in your eye. If you're living an unrighteous life, and then you're trying to call others to be righteous, he goes, that's hypocritical judgment. And that's the first form of unacceptable judgment. Hypocritical judgment. If you look at Romans chapter 2. You see, only when we remove sin from our lives can we clearly see the things that we can help our brothers and sisters with. Then we can see the sawdust. We can see the planks in others, and we can, in an acceptable way, help them using the word of God. Amen? Amen. In Romans chapter 2, in verse 1. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. So, we're going to see later that we...
we are to make spiritual judgments, but we cannot do this if we are stuck in our sins. Jesus says, in order to be a disciple, you've got to turn from your sin and follow Christ in every way. Are you with me right here, guys? Sometimes we, we want to judge others, but we're in the same sins ourselves. And he goes, that's unacceptable. First, repent. Now, repentance does not need to be some drawn-out, long process that takes months and that God's constantly working on with you towards. Repentance is radical. It's an immediate decision. Sometimes if I'm struggling with a certain sin, then I notice someone else in it. Should I just let them continue going since I'm in sin myself? Or should I repent on the spot and go, you know something, bro? I've been in this sin myself, and I'm seeing how much it really hurts my life and hurts God, and I want to call you to change. You just removed the plank from your own eye. So now you can see clearly to make a spiritual evaluation in your brother and sister. Are you with me right here, guys? Amen. You know, if you look in John chapter 7, Amen. it's interesting, the Pharisees made judgments about Jesus, did they not? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Jesus says something very interesting here at the very end in John 7, verse 24. Go, Mike. Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead, judge correctly. Well, this is the second form of ungodly judgment is when we judge before we have the facts. When we make judgments based on just what we think or what appears to be going on. A spiritual man or a spiritual woman of God investigates a little bit, do they not? And one of the things that causes us to judge by mere appearances sometimes is simply because we've got sin in our own lives. We still don't see it clearly. Are you with me right here, guys? And so it's very important that we don't just make judgments based on mere appearances. We can do this even when we're sharing our faith. You know, maybe you've been there before. You see someone, uh, maybe they have a bunch of tattoos and, 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 and they look a certain way. And so you go, uh, they're probably not open to Jesus Christ. Okay. That's ungodly. That's wrong. Yeah. And we've made a judgment based on an, a mere appearance. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Sometimes we can make judgments by the way people dress, by the way they talk, by, by where they come from, what city they were raised in. At the end of the day, we've got to throw all that stuff out so we can make a correct judgment. Come Amen, on. church? Yeah. And so, can we judge each other? Well, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Come on, all right. There are other wicked forms of, of judging in the Bible. I won't get into this one too much, but you can write down Romans 14 for your own study. Um, the Bible says we're not to pass judgment on opinion matters. Uh, these would be things like in the early church they got divided on what, what foods they should eat and what foods they shouldn't eat and if they should celebrate certain days or, or not. And, and, and Jesus goes, in the New Covenant, guys, none of those things are commanded against or for, but hey, here's the deal. If you want to have a personal opinion about this stuff, you're welcome to practice it. Just don't hold it over someone else. And then those of you that, that look at the others that practice that, don't judge them because their faith is weak. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, Jesus says that we cannot pass judgments on opinion matters. So an example would be, you know, if, if someone has a conviction that it's a sin to watch PG-13 movies. Come on, Mike. Uh, at the end of the day, there could be good reasons for them having that, that conviction. Right. And so, but that person cannot hold that conviction over everyone else because nowhere in the Bible does it clearly say that's a sin. Right. But then again, if someone has that conviction, we who don't are to look down on them or pass judgment because of the conviction they have. Are you with me right here? Those are ungodly forms of judgment, and you can have a quiet time on that on your own in Romans 14. Other wicked forms in James, it talks about slander, slandering one another by making judgments that are harsh and slanderous and talk down towards our brothers and sisters. That's ungodly. But here we find some acceptable forms of judgment. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse oh 1. If any of you have a dispute with another, do not dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people. Now this is interesting. The context here is lawsuits had developed in the church. Could you imagine if we were like wow. suing one another and going to court towards one another? That's how dark it got. Now look at Paul's response. It's very fascinating. you got to catch this. He goes... Why would you take a judgment before the world instead of the Lord's people? He believed through the Holy Spirit that God's people were more equipped to make a judgment than the world's judges. And then he says in verse 2, Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Well, when we pass on and go to heaven, the Lord 
says that we're going to judge, reign over angels, and that in some ways we'll actually judge the world. I don't understand exactly all of what that means, but I know this, that part of being in the church is making judgments on trivial cases, as he puts it. We are practicing for the afterlife. Right. We are practicing right now. And you have to make judgments all the time, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. When you get together with to lead your Bible study group, don't you have to make a judgment about kind of where they're at and maybe what they need? Yeah. Yeah. You have to make judgments all the time with your children, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. You have to judge what's best for them, what school maybe they should go to, what particular sport maybe they should play. If they're in trouble, you have to make a judgment that they've broken one of your household rules. Right. We make judgments all the time in the church. Nope. And so it would be silly to go, bro, don't judge me. Come on, Mike. You see the defense that comes when people say, only God can judge me. Yeah. yeah. Do you invite other disciples into your life to spiritually evaluate you? Amen. Do you view that as healthy and godly? Yeah. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, even before this, kind of a previous context here. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, he's writing about church discipline. Uh, one of the brothers in the church had gotten some gross sexual sin. And the Bible teaches that when someone's unrepented in these sins, they can actually be disfellowshipped or asked to leave the church. Wow. That requires judgment on the parts of the leaders in the church. Are you with me right here? Yeah. And he writes here in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. Yep. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral, or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Right. Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Come on. Come on. Woo! <laughs> Holy Spirit lays it out right here. He goes, don't judge those outside the church. They're already lost. He already yeah. talked about where they're going. He goes, they won't inherit the kingdom of God's. He goes, you're to make judgments of those inside the church. Yep. And he goes, here's my judgment. Expel that man who is in sin. Wow. You know, for us, we've got to have a conviction that we've got to disciple one another, and that requires yep. making judgments. Yep. Yep. We are to help one another. We are imperfect human beings, but this is God's perfect plan. Yep. And through his perfect plan, even through the imperfections, I encourage you to read the bulletin article I wrote today. Yeah, it's great. The, the bulletin article is all about how to handle relational conflict That's in the church. Right. Yeah. And, and I love the, the first point I, I came up with is, number one, just accept it's going to happen. Right. <laughs> number one, you just got to know the church is going to disappoint you at some point. Yeah. The church is going to hurt you at some point. I hate yeah. saying that. No one would intend to do that. That's no one right. would want to do that. But at some point, it's going to happen. Someone might make a wrong judgment about you. But Jesus provides, and you got to read the article to find out, a solution on how to deal with those situations. Are you with me right there? Yeah. And it's pretty awesome. You know, in Hebrews chapter 4, how do we as humans make such crazy calls that deal with heaven and hell type situations? Well, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the hearts. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything's uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. Amen, guys? The Bible says one day, we're all going to give an account to God. I would rather people use the Word of God now to judge me and remove the sin out of my life than to be condemned by God on the last day because Amen. that sharp sword didn't cut out the sin that was in my life. The Word of God, it says, judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Mm -hmm. Meaning our measure, remember Jesus talked about the measure you use? Yeah. Our measure is to be the Scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. So in reality, it's kind of true. Only God can judge us. Because when we're bringing the Scriptures to someone, it's God making the judgment. Are you with me right there? Yeah. So that's what Paul means when he says you are to make judgments about each other. In the church, amen? amen? Romans 15, verse 14, you can write it down, says, I myself believe you guys are competent to instruct one another. Paul wrote that the disciples in the church have the ability to instruct and teach and admonish one another. We've been given this right. You know, sometimes uh, I have life group, and one of the things I'll do at the beginning of life group, because we live in this time, a postmodern time, where a lot of the, uh, college students have bought into the idea, well, only God can judge me, and there's no such thing as truth, and what's truth for you may not be truth for me. 
And one of the things I do is I pass around my Bible and I go, you know, I want you to introduce your name and tell me how long you think this Bible is in inches. So some people, uh, maybe 10 inches, some people maybe 12 inches, some people maybe, you know, 8 inches, whatever. And I go, you know, that's interesting. Why do we all come up with different, different answers? Because we're all relying on what we think. Right. Mm-hmm. right. And I go, how would we know? They go, well, pull out a ruler. Come on. And I go, exactly. And so if you pull out a ruler and you measure it, you'll find the exact length. That ruler is the standard of measurement. Right, right. The Bible is the ruler. Yeah. It evaluates our lives. It's the truth. And it's all across the board, the universal standard of measurement. Oh, come on, yeah. preach it. You must know it. You must study it. You must find out if you're living according to it because it will be the standard that judges not just the actions, but the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Now, once again, I would rather be judged by man here on earth and radically change than to be judged and condemned by God and Come sent by. to hell. Are you with me right here? Amen. You know, if you turn to Proverbs chapter 12. Come on, bro. bro. One of the things that stops us from allowing others to make judgments, and that word judgment even sends a cringe sometimes in our, in our, in our you know what I mean? When you hear, bro, I'm going to judge you. I mean, no one walks around saying that kind of stuff. I'm just saying that's what we do when we disciple each other. In Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible says, Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Yeah. You didn't know the Bible used the word stupid, did you? I mean, that's pretty intense. He goes, dude, you're stupid if you hate correction. <laughs> you know, hey, are you stupid this morning? Oh, no. I've been stupid before. You know what I mean? When someone's trying to correct me and disciple me and I'm just stuck in my ways. Yep. You know, sometimes we get pride in our hearts and we get so angry and we're trying to defend ourselves. And if we can only let the defenses down and go, you know something, amen. We all have blind spots. We all have things about us that we cannot see. And that's the whole purpose of the community of God. And it kind of leads to my second point. Is that sometimes we we get this idea, well, if, if that brother that was trying to point out that sin, or that sister that was trying to teach me the Bible, Maybe some of you guys are studying the Bible and you're, you're, you're trying to debate when to get baptized and this sort of thing, and, and maybe you feel like people are judging you and coming down on you and stuff like that. My and they go, if they only knew my heart! Because God knows my heart. And, and, it's, and, and it's kind of this plea, like, no, God knows my heart, it's good. This phrase is usually used by people that are trying to defend sinful actions. For example, someone may be sleeping with someone who's not their wife. And they go, but I really love her, and God knows my love is sincere for her, so he knows my heart, and my heart I'm married to her. Mm. Does not make it right when it stands against the measure of God's words. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone could say, I really want to quit smoking. I know the Bible says it's witchcraft. I know it's pharmakeia. I, I know it's wrong. I want to quit smoking. Uh, but, you know, I just can't yet. But God knows my heart. He knows that I want to quit. Yeah. But when you take it to the measure of God's word... It doesn't add up. Someone could continually miss church, miss life groups, miss meetings of the body, and they go, well, God knows my heart. I mean, I'm there with you guys in spirit. I was just tired this morning. Mm. Mm. And they said, God knows my heart. Come on. You know, what if, you know, we're trying to raise special missions contribution right now. What if I told you, you guys, last night I robbed a bank yep. to um, get our special missions contribution? Because in my heart, I really believe so much in changing the world that I, you know, I robbed, you know, Bank of America last night. <laughs> but you guys go, oh, amen, your heart was good because you really wanted to go and seek and save the lost. No, you'd be concerned, be contacting Kim and Matt and telling them, this guy, there's something wrong here. <laughs> and I think you've got to go back to Revelation 20, verse 12. Something that's fascinating about the scriptures is most times in the scriptures, now there's a few other places, but most times in the scriptures when God talks about judgment, he says he judges our deeds and our actions. It's very interesting, when Jesus returns, the Bible says that, will he find you doing well when he returns? That shows us that when he comes back, if he's to come back right at this moment, you better have your act on straight or you'll go to hell, the Bible says. How is that possible? Why is he justified in doing that? What if he just had a bad day that day? He's justified in doing that because where you're at right now is the sum total of all the choices you've made in your life up to this point. Are you with me right here? The habits we have, the patterns we have. It's all a result of all the different little choices we made. Don't play games with sin because it digs a pit. It stops you. It creates thought patterns. 
negative things in your life that really hurt you. Are you with me right here? Come on, Mike. And so God, yes, He does know our hearts, but our hearts are seen in our actions and our deeds. Yep. You can write down Romans 2.6, 2 Corinthians 5.10, these both teach that God judges us by our deeds, just as Revelation 20 does. So the question then comes, does the heart matter? Do the intentions of the heart matter? Let's go to Matthew 15. The first part of the passage you're very familiar with in our word study. Matthew 15. You guys with me here? Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome, bro. Keep it going. Let's go, Mike. In Matthew 15 and verse 1, then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what they might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father and mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Whoa. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Of course, we've got to question ourselves here when we read this passage because there had been a tradition that just over time became such a strong tradition, was never commanded in the Bible, that they had the ceremonial washing of hands. Did not come from anywhere in the scriptures. You know, many of us, maybe you're visiting, you grew up with certain traditions on how you become a Christian, certain traditions on, on maybe different things you did when you were young. You've got to look at those in light of the scriptures. And Jesus in verse 3 says, why do you break the command of God for the sake of a tradition that's not merited anywhere in the word of God? And then he goes a step further. The Pharisees practiced something called Corbin, where basically they would yeah. take the money that from the, the, the people, that, that, or they put their, I'm sorry, their own money in the temple treasury, and they would say, this money is a gift devoted to you, God, to take care of my father and mother. Uh -huh. But they wouldn't lift a finger to actually do it. It's kind of like some of the times you want to just kind of give your contribution to pray, uh, pay the, the preacher to do your Christianity. You ever been there before? <laughs> oh my. No, he goes, you're not lifting a finger to actually do it. That shows us something. He goes, your heart is far from God because your action in helping your parents is lacking. Yeah. And if you read on in verse 13, I'm sorry, verse uh, 10. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? <laughs> he replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them, they're blind guys. If the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a pit. I mean, Jesus just was never, I mean, he just laid it out all the time, amen? Verse 15, Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull, Jesus asked them? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Come on, Jesus says, immorality, murder, all things that are deeds, where do they come from? The hearts. That's why God's justifying and judging us by our deeds, because our deeds reflect where our heart is at. So once again, people try to deflect, well, God knows my heart. I know I'm going to the club every weekend, but, but God knows my heart. I really want to be righteous. No, you don't. Your heart is wrong before God. And once again, that should scare us that God knows our hearts when you're living in sin. Can a man know someone's heart? Well, you know, look in Proverbs chapter 20. The Pharisees, their heart was far from God, and they, 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 they took comfort in the fact that they were religious, did all these little traditions and everything, but, but they were not close to God because they did not obey Him. Faith without deeds is useless. Amen, guys? Yeah, that's right. You know, as you're turning there, Proverbs chapter 20, and verse 5, it says, The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. Amen. So can someone know another person's heart? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It takes time. You've got to draw them out. That's why Jesus even said to Peter, Are you so dull? 
a lot of times Jesus was trying to challenge people and he said very strong things because he wanted to find out what was really in the heart. Sometimes we have to say strong things to each other so that, that and it gets you going a little bit so that you can get what's in the inside to come out. Are you with me right here? Yep. And what we say reflects a lot of times what's really in our hearts. Yeah. So my question is, are you willing to allow the person discipling you to draw out your heart and disciple you? And challenge you. We all have blind spots. And as I said, pride is what can stop us. What do your deeds show about your heart this morning? Maybe you haven't been tithing or giving to special missions contribution or this sort of thing. That could reflect a greedy and selfish heart. Maybe you've been missing life group or not coming to church. What would that show about someone's heart? It would show that it's a heart that does not treasure the kingdom of God above all things. Maybe your heart treasures work more. Maybe your heart treasures school more. Maybe your heart just treasures your own time more. What's it say about your heart? Not returning people's phone calls or text messages? What does that say about your heart? It says you don't really care. Again, all these actions, sometimes I think we get faked out. We go, well, no, I just didn't feel like doing it. No, your actions reflect what's in your heart. As Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruits. Lust, Jesus said, reflects an adulterous heart. Hate reflects a murderous heart. This is why faith in de- without deeds is useless. Uh, my wife pointed out this verse uh, to me the other day. I thought this was amazing. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17. Come on, Mike. Let's go, Mike. Come on, Chanel. <laughs> Come on, Chanel. Hey. In Jeremiah 17, we read this quite often, and Andre kind of touched on this last week a little bit, and and it it made me think. In Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure. Other translations say desperately wicked. Who can understand it? And and I think as Christians, we stop right there, we just go, we, we all have deceitful hearts. We all have deceitful and wicked hearts. And it's interesting, in verse 10, it says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind, To reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deeds deserve. Well, that's interesting. He examines the hearts, and then right connected to the heart are the deeds and the conduct. It's inseparable. That's why Jesus can judge us based on our deeds, and it reflects what's in our hearts. You see, I want to challenge us today to allow ourselves to be evaluated under the light of God's words. You know, there's a prophecy about when you become a Christian in Ezekiel 36. Let's go, Mike. That prophesied the day the kingdom would start and the new covenant would come. And and it's a beautiful passage because we just learned that man's hearts are deceitful, right? Can't trust your own feelings, can't trust your own flesh. And here in Ezekiel 36 and verse 25, the scripture says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to follow my laws. Amen, guys? The Bible prophesies. He goes, you know, there's going to be a day where the Holy Spirit's going to be received. And when you receive it, God's going to give you a new heart. A heart of flesh, not one of stone. A heart that turns away from idol worship. A heart that turns away from our sinful actions. And a heart that leads us to desire the word of God. Amen, guys? When does God give us that new heart? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 2 here. Like I said, we're all over the Bible today, amen? And if you're visiting with us, we're a church that believes the Bible's the standard, amen? No head but Christ, no creed but the Bible, no headquarters but heaven. That's what we believe. The word of God is to be our standards. Acts chapter 2. In verse 36, Peter is preaching a message. Now, they could have gone after hearing Peter's message. You're judging me, Peter. God knows my heart. But they didn't. Look at what happened to their heart. Verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. We're in Acts 2, verse 36. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the hearts. And said to Peter and the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? If you are studying the Bible right now to become a disciple, you want to get baptized, you need to have a broken heart. Yeah. A heart that's shattered. I always know someone's ready to be baptized, and it is up to the person 
that's studying with them are preaching the gospel to decide when. You go read that in Acts 8 with the eunuch. You go read that with uh, John the Baptist um, when he was looking for deeds of repentance. I know someone's ready to get baptized when they go, what do I need to do? And they've turned themselves in. Yep. Yep. There's no more pride. No more arguing. No more attitudes. No more defense mechanisms. These guys were broken because their sin crucified Christ. Verse 38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, there it is. That's that new heart, that new spirit he was going to give us. The promise is for you and your children. For all of our father, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs that were performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with deceitful and wicked hearts. No. No. Praising God. Oh. Glad and sincere hearts. Glad and sincere hearts. That's what it says, right? Same thing. You know, sometimes we think we have a, 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 a deceitful heart, but we're a Christian. We've been made a new heart. Is that pretty encouraging, guys? Amen. We have a heart that, that desires things. In fact, the Bible says we've been given the mind of Christ. It's when we live by the flesh that we go back to the deceitful heart. Are you with me right here? And so God says the community came together, and they had glad and sincere hearts. And check out what the Lord did in verse 47. Praising right. God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen? Amen. That shows me when we are glad in fellowship, when we are sincere in our fellowship with one another, God's going to add people to our numbers. Amen, guys? Right. God does care about the heart, and the heart will be shown by the deeds and the actions. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this leads, then, to our, our, our third point. And we find here in this passage that the believers were selling their possessions. Why did they sell their possessions? And this is very important for us all to get a conviction on, because this is controversial what I'm about to talk about. Why did they sell their possessions? Because... That was the only place the church was in the entire world at that point. Yep. There were other religious groups. They could have gone back outside the apostles' authority and gone and started their own group and done their own thing. But they didn't. They had to wait. They understood they were under submission to God. So they could not go back to their homes. So they had to sell their possessions so that they could seek first the kingdom and stay in Jerusalem. That's right. right. By the time Acts 8 comes, they eventually plant churches throughout Samaria and then Judea, and a lot of the people are able to go back to the places where they were originally from. Are you with me right here, guys? Yeah. yeah. One of the things we teach in our congregation is that you are required by Jesus Christ himself to seek the kingdom first. Amen. We don't miss church for a job. Amen. We don't miss church for um, some kind of family outing. We believe the kingdom comes first above everything else. Amen. We don't miss church for school events. We believe the kingdom comes first above everything else. Mm -hmm. There will be times and things that you cannot get out of, but how is your heart? Yeah. Do you seek advice about these things and seek the input of others mm -hmm. so that you can not be your own judge, but allow the word of God to evaluate your hearts? This was the conviction they had, and they sold everything to meet the needs. You know, I was amazing. I heard about Jacob's life group got together this past week. And he, and he said, you guys, for our life group, we're going to just call a bunch of people and ask for money for special missions contribution. Oh, Amen. He believes in what we're doing as a church. Uh, they raised, I believe now, probably almost $300. Oh, so, just calling him, Miranda calls him, gets $100. I mean, uh, pretty awesome. Just because one person goes, you know something? We're all going to do this together. And, and I don't sense they felt like they had to or were forced to or something or anything like that. Sometimes we need a little encouragement, amen? Yep. amen. But, but, you know, with that comes a glad, sincere heart. I know there was one person that needed a little encouragement, but afterwards they were fired up when they gave. Amen? All of my heart was encouraged. For our special missions contribution, have you given your entire heart? Mm. Not just your actions. My Not God. like the Pharisees that painted the picture of being part of things. But your heart. And this was the result in this kind of church. You know, our third point is my personal relationship with God. Come on. Come on. That sounds really good. And, you know, something I say all the time, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, I go, my, my, my personal relationship with God. The challenge about this, you're maybe wondering what's wrong with this. The challenge with this saying is it's not found anywhere in the scriptures. And that the early Christians had a communal view of their relationship with God. One of the 
things that happened, I believe probably around the Reformation, was people started reading the Bible um, with an individualistic mindset. Anytime the word you is used in the Bible, the word you is usually plural. And so they started reading scriptures that were written to churches for individuals. And now it created, I did, that's why people can say, be, preach these false doctrines, hey, do you want to come and make Jesus your personal Lord and Savior today? Instead of going, do you want to be admitted to the community of God through repentance and baptism? Wow. You see, baptism was a sign of admittance into a community, and it was seen with your salvation. But these false religions, I believe, are really rooted in this idea of us all having our own individual relationship with God. Now, I'm not advocating that you can't have special times with God, or that your quiet times can't be special, or anything like that. I'm just saying this language has created an individualism that hurts us, because then when people fall away, or they start struggling, or they don't want to be around the community of God. They go, I haven't fallen away, I still read my Bible and pray, I just don't want to go to church. Not understanding that the church is the body of Christ. Yeah. And to disconnect yourself from the body is to disconnect yourself from Christ. For me, personally, when I look at this scripture and the devotion they had, their glad and sincere hearts, in verse 46, how do we know they had glad and sincere hearts? It was seen in verse 42 in their devotion to the community. They were devoted to the fellowship. That was the actions that were seen. I remember when I was going off to college, I was offered many track scholarships because I was going to run track. The places, the cities and that had schools in it that offered me track scholarships did not have a church that was part of our movement, a discipling church that was part of our family there. Right. You know what I did? I had to have the conviction, I need to go to college in a place that has one of our churches. Well, my... And a lot of people think that's crazy. My parents, I think at the time, maybe thought it was crazy. I ended up not running track that first year so I could go to a place that had our church in it. Well, my... It was my conviction, and because of that, God blessed me. I was able to graduate, and I eventually got a track scholarship at another place that did have one of our churches in it. Because when you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, God will take care of you. Exactly. But it's time, guys, as a church to get radical and not be ashamed of this teaching. Right. It's time to throw off all senses of, of, of this garbage that we get fed from the world, that we can just be a Christian anywhere we go, and it's fine, and get back to the devotion of the early church. Mm-hmm. That's the only way that will change the world. Mm-hmm. So, for some of us, when we get hurt by someone in the church, the quickest thing we want to do is leave. But when you have a communal mindset, you understand you can't leave. You've got to figure out how to work it out, and then through that, God matures your character, and yeah. so now you're a better person at relationships. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you go to Ephesians yeah. chapter 2. Let's go, Mike. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike, oh brother. Let's go, Mike. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, as you turn to Ephesians 2, even if you make a pit stop, I'll, I'll show you kind of an example of, of how dangerous this uh, individualistic teaching is. In Ephesians 1, for example, in verse 11, he says, In him we were chosen, also chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan who works out everything in his conformity with his purpose and will. So, some people have read that passage, and they've gone, Christians are predestined on who's going to become a Christian and who's not. And so, basically, Jesus only died for those who would be saved, and everything one else was planned to go to hell. Oh. That sounds like our fair just God, doesn't it? No. And, but again... Reading this passage in an individualistic mindset is what spawns this false doctrine. When you understand, he goes, we, that is somehow plural, that Jesus was predestined. He was predestined. He was chosen before time yep. to die on the cross. And what's Jesus' body, guys? Church. The church. That means that when we decide to follow Christ in repentance and baptism, we are now in the corporate community. We make up Jesus Christ. Is that pretty awesome? And so in that sense, we have corporately been predestined. So if you look in Ephesians chapter 2, Come on, bro. Come on. I know we're getting some theology here, but bear with me here, because I think this point is huge. It can really change your thinking of how you live your Christian life. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 14, he says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. Verse 15, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Amen, guys? Amen. The Bible says that the cross was 
Jesus shed his blood to reconcile people from all nations together into one body, and the Bible says we are now one humanity. I like the old NIV says we're all one man. Amen, guys? Yeah. As a church, we function as one man. That means that the special mission's goal, $36,000. You know whose goal that is? It's our goal. That's right, bro. There will be some people that can't hit their goal. Maybe their faith's weak, or maybe they just, for whatever reason, life circumstances come. That's fine. Are we to look down on them? No. no. But we should understand that it's not like, oh, he didn't get his goal. He's the one that caused us to have to raise more money. <laughs> Come on, Mike. No, it goes, you know something? Amen. That just means I'm going to work harder towards the, the group's goal. Come on, preach it. We understand that as a whole movement around the world. Our whole focus is to evangelize the world. The Christian and, and, and Debbie going to Dallas, it's not like, oh, why does the Dallas church get people sent to them? <laughs> no, it's going, listen. That's part of our community. That's just another region of our church. If you know. We we all function as one body. The singles retreat coming up. You know, it's not like with the singles retreat, like yeah, I'll go maybe if 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 I feel like it or not or something like that. No, no, we are calling all the singles to go to the singles retreats. Come on, bro. Every single one. Amen. You get the time off. You get the kingdom's your priority. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Money's never an issue in the kingdom because they all share their possessions. Yep. You don't have the money. Don't worry. We'll pay for you. It's not a big deal. Come on, bro. We all share together. Right. Amen. Come on, bro. I, I pray that that's our hearts. You know, in Ephesians chapter four. Come on, preach it, bro. Now, I don't want to steal Joe's lesson. Joe, Joe's preaching a little bit on, on some of these concepts tomorrow. Go ahead, bro. Okay. Um, and, and, and I joked with him about taking his lesson, but then as I started thinking about it later, I was like, hey man, some of these things are good points. <laughs> but I won't take the part you're going to preach, bro. Just the part I mentioned to you. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Amen. Every single person in here, look around at every single person. They're all a supporting ligament. <laughs> look to your neighbor to your right and tell them, tell them you're a supporting ligament. You're a supporting ligament. All right, now turn to the person to the left and tell them you're a supporting ligament. Now again, I'm not teaching that's possible. I'm just saying that we have a responsibility 
to strive with everything in us to be together. Yeah. Everything in us. You've got to make every effort in your relationships because the Spirit dwells in God's church. Amen, guys? Yeah. If you're thinking about moving, have you got advice to move to a place where we have a church? Mm-hmm. If you're thinking about leaving, have you sought reconciliation? Come on. Come on. You know, the last and our final point oh my. is... Well, that's legalistic, bro. <laughs> now, maybe you're visiting, you're like, what are you talking about? Well, you know, a lot of times in the church, um, we have rules, if you will. For example, in our church, we go on double dates. Because if you're on a date by yourself, and you're not married, and you're with the opposite sex, there's more temptation, is there not? Yeah. Um, in our church, we encourage, and I'm not ashamed to call them rules or guidelines, it's just what they are. Yeah. Um, in our culture, we've created guidelines to help us remain spiritual. Uh, the leadership of the church has called every member to be totally committed to all the meetings of the body. Sunday morning church, Wednesday night, midweek, and Friday night devotional, and everyone's part of a life group. Uh, it's something that the leadership has called everyone to do because we see in the Bible that they met how often? Every day. Every day. Every day. So minimally, we should be having at least that amount of fellowship. Amen. And yet some people will go, well, that's a little legalistic, bro. Come on, Mike. And I don't think I need to do that. Come on, Mike. It's kind of interesting. I, I, I looked up the word legalism in the Bible and legalistic. It's not in there. <laughs> so that, that's... That was kind of a first surprise. In the old NIV 84, they, they translated one word legalistic, and it was talked about in a positive sense in Philippians 3. Uh, but that's really not the best translation. Uh, the word legalistic, if you look it up in the dictionary, uh, simply means excessive adherence to law or formula. And I go, okay, well, I do want to excessively adhere to the Bible. Amen, I'm legalistic. Now, of course, when people are saying this, they're referring to being more focused on the behaviors and, and not the heart. And that's wrong. I would never uh, encourage that. So in that sense, if you're using legalism in that way, I agree that's wrong. But, but the actual, actual definition is good. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Come on, bro. Let's go, Mike. All right. Awesome. Preach it. Preach it. Come on, Mike. Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse 20. One simple verse Jesus says here. As you're turning there, I will explain a little bit. Uh, one of the, the, the first century churches that came into the church after Jesus died was uh, the, the group called Judaizers. Judaizers wanted to go back to Old Testament uh, laws that Jesus nailed to the cross. And that was wrong. That was relying on works of the law for their salvation. So they taught that you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. You need to observe these holy days to be saved. And and the New Testament does not teach such things to be saved. And so, in that sense, being legalistic to those laws is ungodly and false doctrine. Are you with me right here? Yeah. With that being said, here in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 20, it says, For I tell you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Now, you understand, the Pharisees knew their Bibles. They knew their stuff. Yep. And they were the ones that were looked on. We give them a bad rap sometimes, but they were the ones that were looked upon as like the high religious leaders to right. go to for advice back in that time period. Mm-hmm. It'd be like today, like people like Billy Graham or the Pope or right. Joel Steen or T.D. J. You know, people like this we, we look up to yeah. uh, in our society or our culture as people that they get religious. That'd be kind of like who they were back in their day. And yet Jesus goes to the crowds at the Sermon on the Mount. Now, it's interesting that it's on a mountain. Because, of course, the Old Covenant law was given on Mount Sinai. And Jesus comes and he's now bringing his new kingdom law. Amen? Amen. The law of Christ, as Paul calls it. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you will not get to heaven. Well, what's the law of the Pharisees? He goes on and he explains, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But he goes, yeah, you can not commit adultery, but there could be lust in your hearts. And he goes, lust is the same thing as adultery. Amen. Wow. He goes, you've heard it said not to, to murder someone. Amen. He goes, but do you hate anybody? It's the same thing in God's eyes. Because, yeah, you heard it back in the day, you just divorce someone. He goes, but God hates divorce, Amen. only for immorality. Amen. At the end of the day, Jesus brings a new law 
Because this law surpasses what the Pharisees did. It goes into the hearts. Now, the challenging thing about this that I want think, you to think about, some people have even said things like, I'm so glad we don't live in the Old Testament days because that would be very, very challenging to have to remember all these regulations and stuff. I don't know if that's necessarily true. Maybe. But I think it's a little bit more challenging to work on your hearts. Yeah. To me, it's yeah. easy not to murder someone. I've never yeah. been tempted with that. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> um, hate, that's a lot more challenging. I've never committed adultery. It's not something I've ever planned to do or that. Lust, that's a little bit more challenging. I never, you know what I mean, struggled with, 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 with these kinds of things that, that are so behavioral type kind of things. And Jesus is going for the heart. He goes, that's true righteousness. Yeah. You know, are you righteous this morning? Look at Romans chapter 1. Stuff like Romans 1. You see, legalism wasn't really the Pharisees' problem. It was their lack of legalism that was the problem. They only took it part of the way. They didn't go to the heart. In Romans chapter 1, in verse 5, and I'm speaking of legalism by how we defined it, according to the dictionary. Romans 1, verse 5, Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. The leadership of the church writes that they call people to obedience. The obedience that comes from faith. See, faith leads us to obedience of God's words. Amen. The leadership is to call people to obedience that comes from faith. I, I want to encourage all of us today to think about how we use this term and thought of the church as legalistic. I put before you that very thing that you may think is legalistic might be the very thing that saves your soul. So as we start to come for a landing, I want to just go through a few things that I think people can sometimes say we're legalistic about. Number one is in regards to purity. If you go to Ephesians chapter 5, I talked about this with the brothers on um, Wednesday night, and uh, we're excited. We're starting a a new group um, called Fight Club. Um, uh, purity in the, the men's ministry this Wednesday. Amen, guys? Um, so that'll be Wednesday night at 9 o'clock. Uh, but the, the brothers are going to come together that, that, that maybe have challenges in this issue. Issue. This was something that I had a huge challenge in uh, prior to getting restored to God. And uh, we're going to have, have uh, accountability. Amen? Because Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 says, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Or should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Amen. Pornography, lust, sexual morality, masturbation, these things will send you to hell. Amen. And he goes, you're not to have even fellowship with people that claim to be brothers and sisters that are indulging in these sins. And so the solution, he goes, don't even have a hint of it. It shouldn't even be named among God's people. It shouldn't even be sensed in the church. And this comes with an accountability that we have for one another. So, why do we go on double dates then? And not want to spend time, if you're single, with the opposite sex by yourself. Is that legalistic? You know, as a young, uh, you know, when I got out of uh, college and uh, moved, moved to Phoenix, I started dating... Um, you know, someone at, at the time, and I remember I just felt like I was above the law. I go, well, it doesn't really say in the Bible you, you can't hang out with the opposite sex by yourself, and so, you know, I, I, I think it's fine. Just felt like I was more entitled. I'd preach to others that they should do it, but I thought I was more spiritual. Wow. To my shame, it led to inappropriate touching and impurity. Wow. Now, by God's grace, there's no immorality or anything like that, but I, I just, I thought, wow, I thought I was above these guidelines. Wow. And those very guidelines are the things that could have prevented that. Yeah. Come on. You know, I want to encourage you. I think Jesus would ask you, if you said that's legalistic, he would come back and say, well, why do you want to spend time alone with that right. person? Come on. But... Because Jesus always asks questions. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, yeah. Why do you fight that so much? Yep. Yeah. Well. You know, we expect everyone to have a weekly discipling time here in the congregation. Why wouldn't you want to have a weekly discipling yeah. time? Yeah. Right. Spend time. Why? On. You know, other things that people could say are legalistic in the, in the church is coming to church. We expect everyone to come to every meeting of the body. Hebrews 10, 25. 
It says, let us not forsake the assembly. It's not let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. And then in verse 26, he says, if you deliberately keep on sinning, um, you won't make it. Why? Because we want to hold the word of God as the standard. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Is it legalistic? You know, other things people think reading your Bible every day is, is legalistic. Well, I shouldn't have to read my Bible every day and have a quiet time. Is it, what if I just ignored my wife for a day? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to be legalistic, bro. I mean, I shouldn't have to talk to her every day. <laughs> I mean, what an ungodly heart. And yet we do that with the very bride of Christ, the church. You know, thinking we're above the law will lead to entitlement. And entitlement will take us out of the kingdom. Sometimes we think we deserve something. We go, bro, I, I cranked this Bible study. I cranked the life groups. I've, I've, been, I've been really moving all, you know, all the studies. I've been doing so much. Why are I not a leader yet in the church? And we don't trust that God is sovereign. In the New Testament, there's a thousand and fifty commands. And you want to tell me that God doesn't expect us to do anything in the New Testament? Wow. A thousand fifty commands. You go, oh well, they're, you know, it's unconditional, and you can, you're going to make it to heaven as long as you just believe. No, God has expectations. Yep. Yeah. yep. It's time for us, church, to get radical in our commitment to following the Bible. Amen. We are going to turn up the heat in our discipleship because on, God wants true followers. Come on, Maybe you're visiting and you don't know your Bible very well. I want to encourage you to know the laws of God. To get to know him and what he expects it means to be a Christian. Study the Bible with the person that brought you right after this meeting. So I hope today, maybe you weren't able to find Hezekiah in the Bible. And I know it wasn't in the Bible. And maybe you bought into some of these false ideologies that only God can judge me, no man can. Well, we see that man can't make spiritual judgments using God's word. And through that, God judges us. Number two, we saw that God, yes, he does know our heart, but we can't use that as a defense mechanism to stay in sin. Number three, we found out that my personal relationship with God actually isn't that personal. It's shared with a community. Are you with me right Yeah, bro. And then number four, we saw that, well, that's legalistic, bro. You go, amen. Thank you. I'm strictly trying to adhere to the word of God. And I want to call you today to, number one, invite your discipler to, for a spiritual evaluation. Come on. And then number two... I want us to use our hearts to do whatever it takes to hit our $36,000 goal in two weeks. And I believe with all my heart that we will be real Christians. Amen, guys? Amen. Amen. Amen.